Prior to the administration of Pericles, there had been a three-part balanced government in Athens, as Aristotle writes in his Politics. There was a council on the Areopagus that was an oligarchic element, and that there were elective magistracies, which were aristocratic, and that they had law courts, which were democratic. But of this council on the Areopagus, Aristotle writes, it was this council that kept watch over the greatest number and the most important affairs of the state. But when Pericles was rising in politics, sometime in the late 460s, there was a substantial constitutional change in Athens. As Plutarch writes in his Life of Simon, the multitude broke loose, as in the people, the democratic elements, and overthrew all the ancient laws and customs they had hitherto observed, and chiefly at the instigation of Ephialtes, withdrew the cognizance of almost all causes from the Areopagus. The government was reduced to a perfect democracy, and this by the help of Pericles. Now, the reason why Pericles may have supported this change was that he was impatient with a policy of appointments by lot, which is to say, appointments that were made randomly to certain offices. Plutarch writes, he, as in Pericles, made use of them, which is to say his political surrogates like Ephialtes, against the council of Areopagus, of which he himself was no member, right? So he may have wanted to be a member of this council, as having never been appointed by lot, either chief archon or lawgiver or king or captain, for from old, these offices were conferred on persons by lot. So Pericles might have felt blocked in his political ambitions by this silly rule. And once he had stripped the council of its powers, he would go on to achieve total power. Plutarch writes, he got all Athens and all affairs that pertain to the Athenians into his own hands, their tributes, their armies and their galleys, the islands, the sea, and their wide extended power. But if there had been a political path for him, like if the Athenians had figured out to reform that rule of appointments by lot, perhaps the constitution could have been preserved the way it was. And so we should question why the Athenians didn't just get rid of that rule. Socrates was against this practice as well. Xenophon tells us he taught his companions to despise the established laws by calling it folly to appoint public officials by lot. And so there is an important political lesson here that small reforms can prevent cataclysmic changes in a government. Now, the negative effects of this constitutional rupture were not felt until after Pericles had died, because Pericles, during his career as head of the state, was able to keep the people in check, so people didn't realize till later what the ramifications were, as Plutarch himself affirms. Regarding the period after Pericles, he writes, so great a corruption and such a flood of mischief and vice followed, which he by keeping weak and low, had withheld from notice and had prevented from attaining incurable height through a licentious impunity. So Pericles used his skill as a public speaker to keep the people in check. And it is this power, which is to say his rhetorical skill, that Plutarch praises. Plutarch writes, he, as in Pericles, was able generally to lead the people along with their own wills and consents, by persuading and showing them what was to be done, and sometimes, too, urging and pressing them forward extremely against their will. He made them, whether they would or no, yield submission to what was for their advantage. And Plutarch continues, that rhetoric, or the art of speaking, is, in Plato's language, the government of the souls of men, and that their chief business, which is to say, the rhetorician's chief business, is to address the affections and passions which are, as it were, the strings and keys to the soul, and require a skillful and careful touch to be played on as they should be. So Plutarch has a very practical view of politics, as we can see, that the politician can skillfully play on the people's passions and affections, and utilizing what Plutarch says is that capacity to bear the cross-grained humors of their fellow citizens and colleagues in office. But Plutarch also believed that Pericles was virtuous and that it was his temperance that made his power of persuasion so serviceable to the state because Plutarch writes, virtue, by the bare statement of its actions, can so affect men's minds 
as to create at once both admiration of the things done and a desire to imitate the doers of them. And Plutarch continues, moral good is a practical stimulus. It is no sooner seen than it inspires an impulse to practice. Now, this is a very positive view expressed by Plutarch, that when people see good things being done, they want to do them themselves. But if his implication is that Pericles made people better, then Plutarch is in disagreement with Socrates. In Plato's Gorgias, which is a Socratic dialogue, we find Socrates arguing with a teacher of rhetoric and two of his pupils. Gorgias is the teacher of rhetoric. And both of these pupils are ambitious to obtain that power which Pericles held and used to persuade the people. But in disputing the legacy of Pericles, Socrates says this in Plato's Gorgias, Tell me, whether the Athenians are said to have become better because of Pericles, or quite the contrary, to have been corrupted by him. What I, for my part here, is that Pericles has made the Athenians idle, cowardly, talkative, and avaricious. Now regarding that point, that Pericles had corrupted the people, and to, all, and to those four adjectives. I think if Plutarch had to respond to this point from Socrates, I think his answer would be, that is how the people are. No matter who their leader is, you might as well have someone like Pericles who can get them to do what is best. Plutarch writes, For their arising and growing up, as was natural, all manner of distempered feelings among a people, which had so vast a dominion, he alone, as a great master, knowing how to handle and deal fitly with each one of them. And from those words, like especially that clause, as was natural, it seems like Plutarch does not believe that Pericles corrupted them through anything that he did. And that being the case, there might be a little sarcasm from Plutarch. Like the words, as was natural, as though there's something natural about being distempered when you have a vast dominion. Basically, when you are at the peak of your civilization's wealth and power, of course, you're, you're prone to fits and rages. It's a little, it's silly, and I think it's sarcastic. Returning to Plato's Gorgias, right? So we see young Athenians wanting to imitate this legacy of Pericles, and Gorgias, their rhetorical teacher, he describes the art of rhetoric as follows. It is a thing, Socrates, which in truth is the greatest good and a cause not merely of freedom to mankind at large, but also of dominion to single persons in their several cities. Now, if we've noticed the paradox that Athens was reduced to a perfect democracy, and that at the same time Pericles had complete consolidated power in this democracy, we see this paradox described, perhaps accidentally, by Gorgias here, who credits rhetoric as the cause of both freedom to all, and dominion to one. And Gorgias continues to define rhetoric. I call it the ability to persuade with speeches, the commons in the assembly, or an audience at any other meeting that may be held on public affairs, and I tell you that by virtue of this power, you will have the doctor as your slave and the trainer as your slave, and he keeps going about all the people you can enslave, with rhetoric, and the pupils of Gorgias eat this up, and Polus even challenges Socrates, saying, as if you, Socrates, would not accept the liberty of doing what you think fit in your city rather than not. And when they say this, here's the thing, is that Pericles did more than just guide the people politically. He really did what he thought fit in his personal life. Plutarch's biography asserts that several rumors were made that he was sleeping with many different women and that he even went to war with the island of Samos over this woman Aspasia. And Plutarch writes, measures against the Samians are thought to have been taken to please Aspasia. And of her, he writes, her occupation was anything but creditable, her house being a home for young courtesans. And Plutarch says, maybe sarcastically again, Aspasia, some say, was courted and caressed by Pericles on account of her knowledge and skill in politics. The Samian War did result in an Athenian victory, but it was undertaken with considerable risk, and the Samians, in fact, almost overthrew them in mastery of the sea, as Plutarch writes. But the next generation could see for themselves that Pericles was able to use his power of rhetoric to live his life to the fullest and to gratify his pleasures. And we see this from what Calicles says in Gorgias, luxury and licentiousness 
and liberty, if they have the support of force, are virtue and happiness. Really an astonishing thing to admit as your belief. And of course, Socrates argues against that. But all this being said, no one would wish away the administration of Pericles because there was this great advancement in the arts. Plutarch writes, That which now is Greece's only evidence that the power she boasts of and her ancient wealth are no romance or idle story was his construction of the public and sacred buildings. Of these, Phidias had the oversight of all the works and was surveyor general. Callicrates and Ictinus built the Parthenon, the Odium or Music Room, which in its interior was full of seats and ranges of pillars and outside had its roof made to slope and descend from one single point at the top. And of the famous statue of Athena, Plutarch writes, it was Phidias who wrought the goddess's image in gold. So these projects, by the way, did not just have an artistic purpose, but a political purpose as well as Plutarch writes, with their variety of workmanship and of occasions for service, which summon all arts and trades and require all hands to be employed about them, they do actually put the whole city in a manner into state pay. That's important. The whole Athenian population then was dependent on the maintenance of these funds that flowed into Athens from its allies through tributary payments. So we're going to have to save the buildup of the Peloponnesian War to a video on Thucydides. But let's finish with this anecdote that shows us how Pericles could manage the whims of the multitude. Plutarch writes, When the orators were at one time crying out as their custom was against Pericles, as one who squandered away the public money and made havoc of the state revenues, he, as in Pericles, rose in the open assembly and put the question to the people whether they thought that he had laid out much, and they said, too much, a great deal. Then said he, since it is so, let the cost not go to your account, but to mine, and let the inscription upon the building stand in my name. When they heard him say thus, they cried aloud, bidding him to spend on and to spare no cost. Such a reversal from the multitude, exclaiming one thing, too much, and then its exact opposite, as in, you could never spend enough, we see the fickleness of immoderation. And it's interesting to imagine the dispersal of this mob and what it must have looked like. What do you talk about when you're, when you're walking home with your friends after that? Boy, he sure set us straight. That per- But it, it, this is an example of why Plutarch might think that the caprice of the people is a permanent political reality. And that's why he applauds the ability of Pericles to persuade them to do what is best through whatever rhetorical device, is most effective so long as the ship of state is on an even course. And that's why Plutarch finds it fit to praise this man, Pericles, for employing this, which is to say his rhetorical skill, uprightly and undeviatingly for the country's best interests. (laughs) 